bring them up during the question session. If you could please just either put a number of what talk your question is for or the name of the presenter so that we can keep track of that more easily. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Our first presenter today is Chris Hurt from I University of <laughs> Alabama, your... Birmingham. Alabama, Birmingham. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. All right. Can you see that? Excellent. Okay. So thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'd first like to acknowledge my co-authors on this presentation, as well as my funding source. Deep brain stimulation is an effective therapeutic for advanced Parkinson's disease when the effectiveness of pharmacologic interventions wane. Deep brain stimulation involves implanting an electrode in the individual's brain into a collection of neurons within the basal ganglia, such as the subthalamic nucleus, to regulate electrical activity within that neural network. Now, older DBS leads directed current uh, omnidirectionally out from the lead to stimulate the surrounding tissues. However, new DBS leads expand the ability to stir current directionally using individual contacts. In that way, the stimulation can be directed in a specific direction, or they can be combined to, to create a virtual ring. Now, this, uh, this allows researchers and clinicians to better maximize benefit while reducing stimulation side effects. However, this increases the complexity of programming these devices and quantitative measures of function thus are needed that are reliable and valid to devi guide device programming. Earlier this year, we published a paper looking at a range of effectiveness of single DBS contacts and rings on walking speed. Along the y-axis is individual participants, so 1 through 19. And along the x-axis, we have the different DBS configurations, rank ordered from most to least uh, effective in changing walking speed. Um, the, the color code here is green uh, down to kind of light blue represent kind of clinically significant important differences uh, all the way down to deep blue, which is where individuals performance was actually hampered with deep brain stimulation. And just as an example, uh, if we look at individuals five and six, you can see that there was a clinically significant improvement in their walking speed with this particular configuration. But we also saw with the wrong configuration, a decrement in their performance. So for this individual, or so, so what we're seeing is a wide range of behaviors uh, within a single individual within a single time point in the lab. For this study, we sought to test the hypothesis that optimized performance of simple, but uh, quantitative measures of movement would result in better performance of unilateral DBS compared to standard pharmacological interventions. Now, this study is part of a double-blind randomized controlled trial, the Sundial trial. Um, and for this, uh, presentation, I am presenting on 28 individuals. Our target population is 30 individuals, so we're almost uh, at our recruiting goal. Um, individuals uh, perform the MDS UPDRS, which is a clinical measure of the effect of Parkinson's on fine and, and gross motor movement. Off PD meds, individuals scored a 50 out of 120. Um, and on DBS, they scored a 25, or on, I'm sorry, on medicine, they scored a 25 out of 120. So medicines do have some effect, which is good. That's usually an indicator of whether DBS is going to be effective within this population. Participants visited the lab prior to unilateral DBS surgery at baseline and one month after for initial programming. For all participants, the subthalamic nucleus was targeted for implantation and programming was completed in the practically defined off medication state. Now for our motor battery that we tested participants, we, we selected several constructs around movement function. So we tested gait function and mobility using a 10 meter walk test and timed up and go as individuals walked over a Xeno mat in my lab. We tested static balance using a, a quiet standing where we quantified sway area of individuals while they stood quietly, everyone fixating on a similar point uh, within the laboratory environment. Uh, upper limb dexterity was tested using a nine hole pegboard where individuals will take pegs and put them inside the pegboard and then pull those pegs out. And when the last peg gets back into the cup, the test is over and that's upper limb dexterity. And then we created this task for this particular investigation to assess lower limb dexterity. So we had a foot target task. Individuals are seated with their foot uh, on a piece of tape and the individuals then uh, target or tap the targets with their foot and come back to the green piece of tape. So they counted upward one to nine 
and then back down nine to one. Okay, so this is a similar task that that similar or, or trying to simulate the nine-hole pegboard. We have a, a manuscript out now that shows that this task is reliable and valid for individuals uh, with Parkinson's disease. Again, there's a lot going on here, but along the y-axis, we have the difference in comfortable walk speed, timed up and go, nine-hole pegboard, the foot target task, and sway area relative to their off-medicine case. Okay, so these are different scores. And along the y-axis, we have their medication score, their best DBS score, and also their worst DBS score. What we saw in four of the five functional tasks, the best contact for DBS was superior to medication, while the worst contact for DBS in some cases was detrimental to functional performance. Like, and what I would highlight here again is that this is within a single session within our laboratory environment, and we saw in a lot of cases clinically significant improvements in functional outcomes uh, without having a, a 12 week intervention. Okay, so this is an acute study. Um, so we show again, medication improved motor performance. That's not controversial at all. Um, and actually not that interesting, but good, it's good. Now we also show though an added benefit of DBS that it increased motor performance by 38%. And this is ab above and beyond medication. 38% for pegboard, 32% for comfortable walk speed, 500% for static posture, and 85% for the foot target task. Thus, optimized DBS programming can improve gait, balance, uh, upper and lower limb dexterity. Now, unblinding of this trial will allow us to observe the extent to which these acute findings translate to chronic DBS stimulation. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And as we're changing screens over, our next speaker is Sydney Bowden-Bistel from the Department of Applied Physiology and Kinesiology at the University of Florida. Give me one second. I was furiously typing in a question for Dr. Hurt, so I got sidetracked. <laughs> All right. Look good? Great. So um, I'm going to be continuing with this same population. So uh, I appreciate one right after the other. Um, I'm proud to be presenting some of the research that I came together that has come together over the past two years in collaboration with uh, and mentorship of Dr. Jason Franz at UNC Chapel Hill and uh, NC State. And so continuing on gait impairment and Parkinson's disease, uh, specifically gait impairment continues to be a major contributor to the decreases in quality of life in individuals with Parkinson's disease. Um, currently, there isn't one single standard intervention due to the lack of understanding of the primary factor that actually causes these mobility impairments. While individuals with PD walk considerably slower than healthy age-matched age peers, even when we take into account the changes in gait speed, individuals with Parkinson's disease have been shown to walk with less than 60% push-off force with every step. Demonstrating that decreased propulsive force may be an optimal measure to target for long-term gait improvement. Currently, interventions focus more on the outcomes of gait, such as gait speed or step length, and not much on the best underlying strategy to achieve habitual increased gait speed. For example, gait cueing is rather popular in the physical therapy setting, um, and it targets step length or step time to more specifically target improved gait. Yet individuals could just take longer, slower steps, which is not going to change that sought after metric of faster walking speed. Therefore, um, the purpose of this study currently is to determine if individuals with Parkinson's disease can increase propulsive force using real-time biofeedback in order to not only improve length, but also improve, improve speed. Specifically, you may have heard um, me talk about this in the three-minute thesis talk or in a, the Locomotor One session earlier in this week, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the methods more specifically during this talk. Um, using a Qualysys motion capture system in conjunction with real-time integration through MATLAB, a custom code allows for the collection and processing of each individual's personalized baseline propulsive force, which is collected at the end of a five-minute um, treadmill trial. They do, I do allow all participants to choose their own preferred speed on the treadmill, which they continue throughout all of the trials. During subsequent trials, step-to-step -step propulsive force values are projected onto a screen directly in front of the participant, 
with the blue dot representing their step-to-step push-off forces averaged every three steps, and the red line representing 140% of their own baseline value. We did trial test three percentages and found that individuals could, many individuals, most of them could achieve 140%. So we had participants complete two trials, three trials of two minutes each with an emphasis on the last 30 seconds of each trial. Um, Hopefully I can get this GIF to work and it looks okay, but this is directly what participants do see. So you can start to see some of the problems that we do have with this experiment with large variability within the sample. But um, for statistical analysis, we calculated peak anterior posterior ground reaction force and stride length of the last 20 strides from the trial that produced the greatest average push off. So we are looking at just 20 strides of basically their best performance. Participants were successfully able to respond to the real time biofeedback and increase their propulsive force on average of 4.8% body weight. This basically links up to about 130% of their baseline. So they weren't quite able to reach that 140%, but they were able to increase increase above um, that baseline value. Specifically, if we're talking about what this means in the context of other individuals, this red dashed line on the screen represents what some studies have found that healthy older adults walk at on the treadmill at 1.2 meters per second. So they were able to improve above the marker of healthy age matched older adults. Unfortunately, we don't see much change in their stride length on the treadmill. We believe this to be mostly due to the fact that there are space constraints on the treadmill and they're not able to potentially transfer over that increased propulsive force in the treadmill setting. In general, uh, we take this all to mean that Individuals with Parkinson's disease can use visual biofeedback to increase their propulsive force without changing the speed of the treadmill at any time. Throughout this experiment, the treadmill speed does not change. All that they change is their own individual patterning. Uh, We interpret this finding to suggest that individuals with Parkinson's disease do have access to a propulsive force reserve that we could potentially tap into for future interventions. But it's very important to note, and as you can see here in the red dashed lines, not all individuals improve and not all individuals improve by the same amount. So within this study, what we're looking for um, expanding into, we only have nine individuals now. Our goal is to reach um, approximately 25 in this group. And we'd like to look at uh, different determinants and secondary determinants of what may explain their ability to do this task, including balance, strength, and disease severity. So we hope the completion of this study would be better understanding the underlying mechanisms of improving gait speed and Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Sydney. Our next speaker is Kang Hong Shen from the Department of Kinesiology and Health Education, the University of Texas at Austin. Let me, <clears throat> excuse me, let me share my screen. So can you guys see that? Okay, great. <clears throat> so hi, I'm Ken Hong Shen from uh, UT Austin. And in this study, we're investigating the changes in stepping bound mechanics after six weeks of perturbation use rapid limb loading training individuals with chronic stroke. So as mentioned in the topic, our intervention is tar- targeting limb loading because it's commonly impaired after stroke. For example, you can see last scrunchion force, uh, uh, generated from the periodic limb in this video clip, which indicates less limb loading. And this insufficient limb loading affects propulsive force and thus decreases walking speed. So also losing ba- when losing balance, the ability to quickly load and unload one of the lower limbs to take a protective step is related to fall risk in people with chronic stroke. So sufficient and rapid limb loading is important in restoring function in people who have had a stroke. However, it's uh, barely achieved during conventional therapy. So we've developed a training platform that could deliver rapid limb loading to a, uh, people standing on it. So when participant stands on it, one of the support servers drops 4.3 centimeters. And here's a video recording during the data collection session. So this unilateral drop tails the body and load the drop limb. So uh, we're using the vertical ground jump force to indicate limb loading. And with this training platform, around 90% body weight can be loaded to the paritic limb within 300 milliseconds. 
So in this study, you want to see if delivering repetitive loading to the paretic limb, what uh, our training platform can improve its limb loading characteristics during voluntary movement. So we conducted a study that provides training for people with chronic stroke. In each training session, their paretic leg would drop 50 times. And the entire training program was consisted of three, three sessions per week for six weeks. And there were two tasks we used to measure the training outcome. So the first one is step test. So as shown in the video, it takes uh, a test one's ability to quickly put one foot on and off a step. And the steps taken in 15 seconds is recorded. And the second task is choy reaction stepping. That the light cue indicates the time and uh, which side to take a forward step. And our preliminary al analysis includes eight participants. So we first look at the stepping performance when the paretic limb uh, is the stance limb. And there were two variables we used to indicate limb loading. The first one is the weight transfer time, which is the time from peak step limb loading to the time when the, uh, the force beneath stance limb exceeds the step limb. And the other is the peak stance uh, limb loading. So we found that weight transfer time appears to be reduced after training and the peak stance limb loading or the vertical grunge force beneath the stance limb was increased. And although the amount is not substantial, it's very consistent that uh, the improvement was shown in all participants. Also the step test score improved by more than 20%. And again, it's pretty consistent across the participants. So, and then we look at the performance when the paretic limb is the step limb, because when taking a forward step, the step limb also has to quickly load and then uh, unload. So we measure the time from a uh, likely onset to toe off, which is related to fall rates, and it's reduced by 12% after training. And, uh, but the time to toe off consists of two components. One is the reaction time the from like you to when they start to load the, the limb. And the other is the loading and only time. We want to see which component is improved after training. And our results show that it's more likely the loading and loading time was improved. So in conclusion, our study suggests that our perturbation-based training can enhance voluntary limb loading in a paretic limb in individuals post-stroke. And specifically, when the paretic limb is the stance limb during stepping, the weight transfer time appears to be reduced after training, and the amount of limb loading was increased, and step test score was also improved. And once paretic limb is the step limb, the time to toe off was improved after training, and it's likely due to the reduction in loading and loading time. So this is an ongoing project that will compare this training program to conventional ther therapy. And our target subject number is 15 in both groups. And so a positive outcome will motivate the development of this training platform into a portable rehabilitation device. So thank you. And this is collaboration between UT Austin and University of Maryland and funded by R21. So uh, please feel free to contact us if you have any comments or questions. Thanks, Ping Sheng, or Ping Hung. And we'll move on to our last talk of this portion, um, presented by Ashley Collimore from the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at Boston University. Um, I don't know if you're still yep, muted, I actually. Think, I think it should be good now. All right, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm gonna to be presenting our study on post-stroke gait training with a music-based digital therapeutic that provides rhythmic auditory stimulation to improve the metabolic cost of walking and gait asymmetry after stroke. So post-stroke walking is slow and metabolically expensive. As a result, people post-stroke tend to not walk very much in the community. Uh, prior work by Ganley and colleagues in 2008 clearly shows that people post-stroke, shown in red, use more energy to walk than controls, which are shown in white. And they found this to be true at multiple speeds, which is reported on the x-axis. This increased metabolic cost of walking is a result of post-stroke gait changes. As shown by Patterson and colleagues in 2010, people post-stroke, again shown in red, have substantial asymmetries that are not seen in controls. Interventions that can improve gait mechanics and restore gait symmetry have the potential to reduce the metabolic cost of walking after stroke. One such intervention is rhythmic auditory stimulation or RAS. When we hear a rhythmic beat, such as when walking while listening to music, we naturally adapt our cadence to match this beat. This effect, which occurs subconsciously, is known as auditory motor entrainment. 
Studies show that auditory motor entrainment results from connections between auditory and motor brain regions that allow auditory cues to influence motor output. Rhythmic auditory stimulation is a standardized, individualized, progressive, and data-driven gait training intervention that leverages auditory motor entrainment as the primary mechanism of action. RAS has been extensively studied for the past three decades across disease states, and numerous studies have demonstrated its efficacy to improve walking speed and spatial temporal parameters. In RAS, the selection and progression of the target rhythm depends on continuous clinical assessments of the patient's baseline abilities and their ability to safely entrain to the rhythmic auditory cues. The sparsity of clinicians trained to deliver RAS limits its reach as an intervention. Additionally, most training occurs in clinical settings that are not easily accessible by patients over long periods. To improve both reach and accessibility, we need a way to implement RAS interventions at scale. So in this study, we report on a closed loop digital therapeutic designed to facilitate RAS intervention outside of the clinic and in the home and community. In prior work, we have shown that digital RAS training is safe and feasible to implement after stroke and leads to significant improvements in overground comfortable walking speed. The primary goal of the current work is to investigate the effect of a single digital RAS training session on the metabolic cost of walking after stroke and spatial temporal asymmetries. We collected data from 10 individuals who are more than six months post-stroke. Inclusion and exclusion criteria as well as the participant characteristics are listed here. All participants completed a pre-training evaluation during which they walked on a treadmill for three minutes at their comfortable speed. They then completed 30 minutes of overground training using the digital RAS system. At the end of training, participants completed a post-evaluation on the treadmill at their pre-matched comfortable walking speed. Metabolic and spatial temporal data were then calculated during 30 seconds of steady state walking. Our results show that a single training session led to significant group level improvements in metabolic cost and temporal asymmetries. We did not observe a change in spatial asymmetries. In this graph here, we have walking economy deviation from normal on the y-axis, meaning a value of zero represents the metabolic cost of neurotypical adults. A negative change in the y-axis represents an improvement with the ideal goal being a reduction to zero. At the group level, we saw a 14% reduction in the metabolic deviation after stroke. We saw reductions of similar magnitude in the outcomes of step time asymmetry, stance time asymmetry, and swing time asymmetry. These group level improvements were driven by consistent improvements at the level of individual subjects. For metabolic cost, we see that eight out of 10 participants improved their metabolic cost following training, as shown in blue. And then we see a similar trend with the temporal asymmetries. These results demonstrate that a single session of digital RAS training can lead to significant improvements in metabolic cost and temporal asymmetry in post-stroke walking. These single session improvements are on par with other rehabilitation paradigms, including robotics, functional electrical stimulation, and high intensity treadmill training. Although many of these studies report changes after several days of training. With only 10 individuals, this study was not powered to look at the relationship between metabolic cost and spatial temporal outcomes. Another limitation of this study is that participants completed the training in the laboratory under supervision, so more work needs to be done to determine the feasibility of self-delivery. Overall, this work is an important first step towards the ultimate goal of unsupervised use of a music-based digital therapeutic to retrain walking after stroke. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. We'll now have about 10 minutes for questions and just a reminder, if your question doesn't get asked, um, speakers, you can look back in the chat for questions and answer them there. And we'll also have a spatial chat after this session. Great. So the first question, and I'm going to go with this one, because I think we were all thinking about this 500% benefit in Sway for Chris Hurt. Can you explain why and were the benefits of DVS more profound in the lateral or anterior posterior directions? And did you consider Sway ratios with eyes open or eyes closed? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so the first, uh, yeah, we, we, we are still analyzing our data now. So, so that is a very large change in sway area. Again, keep in mind, they're coming in off med, off DBS. And then with DBS, uh, you know, they're, uh, 
I'll say that it's surprising and I'm not sure why just yet. Uh, we did not specifically at this point break up into medial lateral and four aft directions. This is just sway area writ large. Um, secondarily, uh, while we, so we have multiple interactions with these participants over the course of a year, and we have a, a larger motor battery that individuals perform at different interactions. And we do a series of static postural tests where we have them stand uh, with their uh, feet at a comfortable distance, feet together, semi-tandem and tandem. So we have that just for the programming sessions uh, because they were already very long. And so we had to limit the number of tasks that individuals could perform. So we just did the standing quietly uh, with, the, with their feet at hip distance apart. So we do have more data that we'll be able to unpack as the trial uh, completes. Okay, thank you. And there is a question um, for Sydney about stride lines, which actually, yeah, about stride lines, which I kind of had a question about. So since you're using a fixed speed treadmill, you're not, you say you're not seeing uh, increases in stride lines or step length, um, possibly to, to stay within the balance of the treadmill. So my question is, do you have, um, have you considered using an uh, uh, adjustable or uh, self-paced user-driven treadmill to try to sort of get that stride length in addition to propulsive force. Yeah, so um, we're, it's trend, we always, I hate using the word trending, but it's trending in the right direction where we think that once we improve our sample size, we'll be able to have the individuals that were able to increase propulsion and increase length on the treadmill. Um, I the whole purpose of using a set speed on the treadmill was to take that out of the equation um, because we, the whole purpose of, if like, if you have someone walk faster, like just say walk faster, that's not their habitual gate speed. Um, they're gonna be employing a, dot, a lot of different strategies in, in order to walk faster. Uh, so we really were trying to constrain that specifically. Interestingly, we do have a control group that um, we basically just instruct them to push off harder and we don't actually give them biofeedback uh, and we're interested to see what that does with them. And then we actually have both groups, the control group and the biofeedback group walk over ground with and without instructions um, to see how that impacts as well. But the it's very difficult to have individuals with Parkinson's disease walk on the treadmill at all. We've had to exclude three to four participants just because they can't do it safely. Um, so maybe in the future, maybe with a very specific set of individuals, we could get to that adaptation of using a self-driven treadmill. And just a uh, question related to that from Brian Selgrade. Uh, did you see any changes in breaking force or impulse that could have allowed um, study, study yeah. participants to stay on the treadmill? Yeah. Yeah, so we're looking at impulse. Um, we haven't looked at it yet. I think that that's kind of where it is. We're looking at trailing limb angle too um, as a, a, a supplementary measure. Interestingly, we think that there's going to be some really interesting stuff when it comes to asymmetry in this population because although I don't tell them to, I just say push off harder and I don't tell them to use one leg over the other, they all do it. Um, and so I think that that's going to be one of the most interesting things because we see them breaking really hard with one leg and pushing off really hard with the other. And so that makes the data wash out when you average the limbs together. All right. Our next question is for Peng Hong. Uh, how did you choose the drop height? And do you think that changing this could change the results of the intervention? And basically, is there like an optimal drop height? Yeah, so that's a great question. We choose this drop height based on our pilot testing that want to induce about 90 to 100% of body weight loading on the limb. We, want to, we don't want to destabilize or cause any safety issues. So we tried several drop height and like we found this one to be the, the best across for, for all the participants we had. So yeah, but I, I think like changing drop height would be a interesting study and we might need to start from healthy population to see why that changed people's real response. And then I'm gonna ask a small question as well. Uh, did you assess how long people retained these changes in loading? Uh, we do have a retention session, but uh, we, we haven't analyzed the data yet. And we're st it's still an ongoing project. So we only have like two or three people complete the retention test. So oh, yeah. I look, I 
look forward to seeing those results at next Thursday. Yeah. Thank you. And for Ashley, a uh, question from Karim Ismail. Um, do you anticipate greater changes in metabolic costs with even more sessions, or would there be some sort of plateau and change over time? Um, and, and also, tack on my own question, is do you think like uh, having music versus just a metronome would have a different effect? Um, so yeah, and, and was there like a tempo you um, sought after? Yeah, so kind of a lot in there. I do think um, metabolic cost will continue to go down to a point. In multiple sessions, you know, the intervention should lead to more lasting changes. You know, this was just one 30 minute session. So what could happen after several weeks? Um, and there is actually a clinical trial going on right now to look at some of those effects. We uh, targeted using music primarily because the goal is to send it home and we think it'll be more engaging for users. So I don't know if tempo wise, if using a metronome or music is necessarily more important. There's been a lot of kind of conflicting research out there on this, but in terms of adherence and getting people to use it at home, we think the music's gonna be really helpful for that. Um, and in terms of which tempo we sought after, it was basically as fast as they could safely go. Um, so the way that it works, I know there's another question in the chat to you about how to get it to walk to their speed. Um, it's actually based on IMUs and the goal is more about the cadence that they're walking at and not necessarily the speed. Um, and then our hypothesis is that by increasing their cadence over time, we then see improvements in speed that go with it. Um, so goal was as fast as they could go. Um, safely. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I think we're ready for our second block of talks. Uh, I will be moderating those talks. I, uh, my name is Natalia Sanchez, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Southern California. And our first speaker is Leo Song from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Can you guys see the screen? Yes, perfect. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction and I'll get started with the talk. Um, I, uh, so uh, traditional uh, manual wheelchair and power wheelchair users have uh, many limitations. Uh, for example, they cannot move sideways, they're heavy and bulky, and require the use of both hands uh, to propel uh, the wheelchair. So the group in our lab developed are developing what's called Cure. It's a personalized, unique rolling experience, uh, and it is a novel wheelchair concept. So this Cure is unique in that it's self-balancing and is a ball-driven mobility device, which allows for a compact form factor and, is <clears throat> and can move omnidirectionally. So here's a Gen 2 minus prototype of, uh, of Cure um, that demonstrates this self-balancing capability um, and this omnidirectional capability. So, the person you see here, is, uh, her name is Tatiana McFadden, who is a Paralympian that won 17 gold medals. Yeah, 17 gold medals. And so she's riding right next to our wheelchair that we developed. Um, now, the unique thing about uh, Pure is its sit and go design, um, it, meaning it's hands free. Uh, it does not require any wearable sensors, so it's a non wearable interface, and utilizes what's called a lean to steer control, uh, meaning the user can lean their upper body to steer or navigate pure. And we have in the lean to steer control, there are three different drive modes. The first is steering, where the, the, if the user leans forward, the, ball, the wheelchair would move forward. And if the user leans left, the uh, wheelchair would turn or steer to the left direction. The next is slide mode, where if the user leans to the left, uh, the wheelchair would just simply slide to that direction without changing its heading angle. And lastly, there's spin, where the user can rotate about the same uh, stationary axis, uh, changing the heading angle of pure. So how do we develop such hands-free interface uh, for navigating pure? Uh, we propose what's called FSS or force sensing seat, which is a custom force plate uh, placed below the seat frame, as you can see in this figure. This force FSS can quantify the rider's force of movement in terms of forces, moments, and center of pressure. It is a non-wearable device, meaning you don't have to put any sensors on the uh, subject. And it provides useful data, such as the rider's mass for a robust, robust and stable controlling controller for self-balancing purposes. 
So we explored uh, three methods, control methods for navigating Pure. The first is the joystick method, which serves up as a common baseline interface. So kind of like as a full standard. Um, the way it works is uh, the user does not need to lean, but simply needs to use the joystick. So the purest velocity uh, is simply a function of the signal from the joystick. The next control method is called the native control, which only uses the upper body dynamics of the user to navigate pure. So the purest velocity is only affected by the leaning dynamics or the upper body dynamics of the user. And we expect that there, it the user needs to lean uh, a lot to be able to navigate pure using the control method. And lastly, there's the enhanced control method that uses not only the upper body dynamics, but also the readings from the FSF. So the velocity of pure is a function of the dynamics of the user, as well as the signals from the FSF. And we expected that there will be less leading needed to navigate pure. We performed two studies to better understand the FSS. The first is the validation study, where we validated and uh, improved the accuracy of the FSS readings by comparing its data to gold standards, like force plate or motion capture. And we, we determined that the FSS was sufficiently accurate for our purposes. Then we performed some simulation study uh, to explore the feasibility of our device by having the subjects navigate through a virtual obstacle course, replicating an indoor environment, uh, using three control methods, as explained before. So the joystick is serving as a baseline. The native control only utilizes the lean dynamic, which is comparable to a segue, actually. And the enhanced control method that uses the lean dynamics of the user and the signals from the FSS. So the results show that the enhanced control method indeed require less leaning than the native control to achieve the same speed. So it can be more suitable for wheelchair users who have less trunk mobility. However, the native control was more stable and required less corrections than the enhanced control method. So a combination of the two or switching between the two may be helpful. And, and interestingly enough, enhanced control was similar if not faster than the joystick method for certain zones in wider hallway because it's utilizing not only signals from the episode, but also the dynamics of the upper body to propel the viewer uh, much faster. Uh, lastly, the performance metrics were dependent on the rider's ability to plan their path. So incorporating some sensors that can scan the environment and assist the path planning process and improve the safety and the speed of pure. And with, and with that, uh, we'd like to thank you, this funding uh, organization and our team. Uh, this is a very collaborative effort. Um, and uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Justin Scott from Michigan State. All right, hello everyone. As she said, uh, my name is Justin Scott and today I'll be talking about changing shear forces and pressures on the buttocks and their implications for pressure injuries. So I'd first like to start off by saying what a pressure injury is. A pressure injury is localized damage to the skin and underlying soft tissue that usually occurs over bony prominences. They are particularly prevalent in people with spinal cord injuries who have prevalence rates up to 47% in some care facilities. And overall for wheelchair users, there's about an 80% lifetime risk for developing at least one pressure injury. These prevalence rates and this lifetime risk drive the $27 billion annual treatment cost in the United States alone. Risk factors for pressure injuries include sustained normal and shear loads, on the body and you can think of sustained normal loads as squishing loads. So if you squish something like your arm or something like that and shear loads are rubbing loads. So those are parallel to the body. And these are especially uh, concentrated in the lower back and buttocks while seated in particular around the bony prominences of the sacrum, the coccyx and the ischial tuberosities where most pressure injuries form. So because of that strategies have been implemented to prevent pressure injuries such as reclining and tilting wheelchairs, which you can see here on the bottom of the slide, and also specialized cushions to distribute the pressures on the buttocks uh, over the entirety of the buttocks instead of concentrating them in certain areas. However, there are limitations to both of these strategies, which mean that pressure injuries have persisted as a medical issue. And therefore, the goals of this study were to evaluate back recline and seat pan tilt as seated repositioning strategies for preventing pressure injuries, and to investigate a custom nylon cushion cover's ability to reduce shear force on the buttocks while seated. 
So the first thing that we did is we built an articulating chair with isolated back recline and steep pan tilt movements as seen in the bottom left. We instrumented this chair with six axis load cells beneath all of the supports and pressure mats over top of the supports. We then designed a custom nylon cushion cover, as you can see on the bottom of the slide, which is the blue uh, cushion cover. And we compared that to a vinyl cushion cover, which is just on top of that, uh, which is more standard for a chair or wheelchair cover. We then collected normal and shear loads on the articulating chair with both of these covers on 20 able-bodied participants using static measurements. So that meant the participant got into the chair, we moved the chair into the position that we wanted it to be in, and then we took a pressure and a force measurement. And then we moved the chair again into a new position, took a new uh, measurement without getting data in between the two measurements and without the participant leaving the chair. We also collected uh, pressure data and segmented the pressure mats on the seat pan and on the back so that you can see the posterior half of the seat pan pressure mat on the left was termed the buttocks and the inferior third of the pressure mat on the back was termed the lower back for those uh, regions where pressure injuries are common. We found the maximum pressure regions in each of those uh, pressure distribution mats uh, by finding the three by three sensor area with the maximum average pressure. And we turn that maximum pr average pressure into force by multiplying by the area of the three sensor or the three by three sensor array. So we collected the maximum pressure data for three, uh, three angles of, or three levels of recline angles, zero, 10 and 20 degrees and three seat pan tilt angles of zero, 15 and 30 degrees in all combinations. So we combined every recline angle with every seat pan tilt angle for nine different positions to collect the normal data. We collected the shear data on the three recline angles, so zero, 10, and 20 degrees. So that's for the shear forces. Moving on to our results, for the maximum normal loads, we saw uh, we have different levels of recline in green and different levels of uh, seat pan tilt in blue, with the lower back being on the left and the buttocks being on the right. And what we saw was that when you increased or when the uh, back recline angle was increased, the maximum force or the maximum load in the lower back and buttocks increased while the maximum load in the buttocks and lower back decreased with increases in seat pan tilt. With the shear force results or the shear load results, we have the, uh, or not the blue, the green bars indicating the two layer nylon cover and the white bars indicating the vinyl cover and the three levels of recline on the x-axis. We saw that back recline increased shear force on the seat pan, regardless of which cover was used. And we also saw that using the two layer nylon cover reduced shear force by about 10% on the seat pan, regardless of the recline angle. So taken together, these results mean that we, uh, when I started this presentation, I first said that back recline and reclining chairs is, are one of the strategies to uh, prevent pressure injuries. In fact, they're the most common repositioning strategy for wheelchair users but our results show that it increased max force on the buttocks and on the lower back, and also increased shear force on the buttocks. Seat pan tilt decreased the max force on the buttocks and lower back. However, it's not available in any power wheelchairs commercial or commercially available power wheelchairs. We also saw that in new cushion covers can be developed with new materials in order to reduce shear force on the, on the buttocks and therefore uh, reduce another factory factor associated with pressure injuries. So with that, that's all I have. I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank the BDRL at Michigan State for supporting this as well as NSF. Thank you so much, Justin. Our next speaker is Joshua Wintrush from the University of Kentucky. Okay, can everyone see that? All right, so my name is Joshua Winters. Today I'm gonna to be talking about impaired quadricep function in knee mechanics and active females with, <clears throat> with low back pain. Uh, this was a secondary analysis done on a subset um, of data collected uh, during Alexa Johnson's dissertation work while she was at Kentucky. So thank you, Alexa. Approximately 15% of female athletes experience low back pain compared to about 6% of male athletes. 
female athletes um, with low back pain are more likely to present with reduced lower extremity strength compared to their male counterparts. And this reduction in lower extremity strength, specifically at the quadriceps, may alter knee mechanics during running. Individuals with low back pain may present with an increased knee joint stiffness or reduced knee flexion during the stance phase of running, indicating that during running, the knee does play a significant role in the attenuation of shock. Therefore, the purpose of this analysis was to determine if active females who suffer from low back pain have impaired quadriceps function and compensatory knee mechanics during running uh, compared to active females without low back pain. Eligibility for this analysis, uh, participants had to score a minimum of a five on the Tegner physical activity scale, have no history of previous lower extremity surgery or a lower extremity injury within the last year. The low back pain group must have reported experiencing low back pain for a minimum of four months, while the control group had no reported history of low back pain. Through this criteria, we were able to recruit 20 active females with low back pain and 20 age, mass, and height matched controls. Quadricep strength was evaluated or was assessed as peak isokinetic knee extension torque. Um, and we did both dominant and non-dominant limbs. Dominance was determined by asking the participant which leg would they kick a ball with. Running mechanics were evaluated over ground level running on a 16 meter runway between speeds of 2.7 and 3.5 meters per second. We had a 14 camera Vicon <clears throat> system with two Vertec force plates and we used visual 3D to analyze the motion capture data. We ran a two by two repeated measures of NOVA to look at a group by limb interaction with post hoc analyses to further investigate uh, main effects. So our results from this analysis, we found that there was a significant between group effect for quadriceps strength. With the controls demonstrating greater quadriceps strength in both limbs compared to that of low back pain. We also found a within subject effect for both quadriceps strength and for average loading rate, which was calculated as the slope of the vertical ground reaction for spring run. Um, both groups demonstrated asymmetrical quadricep strength with greater strength on the dominant side compared to the non-dominant side, while only the low back pain demonstrated average loading rate, you know, uh, in, uh, asymmetrical average loading rate with a slightly greater average loading rate on the non-dominant side. When we look at the knee, uh, we found significant between group effect for peak knee flexion. Again, the controls demonstrated greater peak knee flexion in both limbs compared to that of the low back pain group. We also found significant within subject effect for peak knee flexion and knee extension moment, with the low back pain group demonstrating asymmetry in peak knee flexion and internal knee extension moments, while the control groups did not. The dominant limb demonstrating greater knee flexion and greater internal knee extension moments compared to non-dominant. So we found that females with low back pain who were active demonstrated reduced quadricep strength, reduced peak knee flexion angles or a stiffened knee gait pattern, asymmetrical knee kinematics, asymmetrical loading rates, and asymmetrical knee joint loading during run. These findings may be of clinical relevance for the onset and recovery of pain during running, the risk of developing secondary musculoskeletal injuries or chronic disabilities such as knee OA, uh, and the progression of low back pain severity throughout the individual's lifetime. But additional research is needed to further understand the relationships between low back pain, impaired quadriceps function, and altered knee mechanics. We don't necessarily know exactly where the cycle begins, or how it ends, if it does, um, and how these components are linked to one another. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joshua. And our last speaker for this session is Chan Hao Wang.
from the University of Illinois in Chicago. And we can't hear you. I think you're still muted. Okay, can you, you hear go. me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that. No, Sorry okay. about. Yeah. So my name is Chin Hao. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Kinesiology and Nutrition at the University of Illinois at Chicago under Dr. Karma Fouché. So first, I would like to thank the ASB for the opportunity to present my work. So today, I'm going to present the study title of a split belt treadmill training improves gait efficiency in people with hip osteoarthritis. So reduced gait efficiency has been found in people with hip OA, measured as increased metabolic energy expenditure or decreased mechanical energy exchange, which is represented as percentage of recovery. Additionally, step long is commonly reported as being affected in people with hip OA with a shorter step length on the unaffected side than the affected side and could potentially influence gait efficiency and further restrict physical activity level. So modifying step-long asymmetry could be a potential rehabilitation strategy to improve gait efficiency. So there is a rehabilitation intervention utilizing motor adaptation, a form of error-driven motor learning, targeting specific gait deviations for people after stroke. Error augmentation is a motor learning technique in which the motor error is amplified, driven the nervous system to make corrections. So these techniques can be applied to address step length asymmetry through scapular treadmill training, during which the step long asymmetry is magnified when the individual exposed walk at the builds moving at different speed. So this increase in step long asymmetry, which is error, provides a prompt for individual to recalibrate their motor command in a feedback manner to reduce asymmetry. A previous study has found that a spiritual treadmill adaptation session could temporarily induce step-long symmetry in stroke patient with step-long asymmetry at the baseline. Improved step-long asymmetry has shown improvement in decreased cost of transportation in stroke patient. Moreover, when an equal step length gradually changed to equal step length in healthy subject, the net metabolic power is also reduced. However, this rehabilitation strategy has not been explored in the hip OA population to improve gait efficiency. So the purpose of this study was to determine the effect of a spectral treadmill training, modifying step length on gait efficiency in people with hip OA. So we evaluate 10 women with unilateral hip OA. We conduct a spectral treadmill testing with a four period warm up, baseline, adaptation, and post adaptation with motion analysis and metabolic energy analysis. So after spectral treadmill training, the step long asymmetry was decreased, increased the mechanical energy exchange and decreased O2 rate. So the figure A illustrate an improvement in step long asymmetry in people with hip OA. The top part of the figure A is step-by-step step length from a representative participants. So the bottom one is the average of the step long asymmetry across different periods of the spectral treadmill training. So the figure D is the step long asymmetry difference in individual hip OA participants during the baseline and the end of adaptation period. So there was a significant effect of the training period for symmetry index for the step length. And the post hoc testing revealed that, that symmetry index for the step long significantly decreased from the baseline period to the beginning of adaptation. Thus, at the end of adaptation period, we see that result in more symmetrical oh, step length on the two limb. Uh, and, and I already gave my talk and now it's just- Post hoc testing further revealed that symmetry index for the step long significantly decreased from the baseline period to the end of adaptation period, as you can see at the figure D. The figure B illustrates an improvement in O2 rate in people with hip OA. So the figure B is the average of O2 rate across different periods of a spectral treadmill training. Figure E is the O2 rate difference for the individual hip OA participants during the baseline and the end of adaptation periods. 
post hoc testing revealed that O2 rate significantly decreased from the baseline period to the end of adaptation. Additionally, O2 rate significantly decreased from the beginning of the adaptation to the end of the adaptation period. Moreover, the decreasing of the symmetry index for the step length was significantly associated with the decreasing O2 rate from the baseline to the end of adaptation period. The figure C illustrates an improvement in mechanical energy exchange in people with HIPAA. Post hoc testing revealed that mechanical energy exchange significantly increased from the baseline period to the end of adaptation, as you can see on the figure F. So in conclusion, I found that one session of the stable tremor training reduced step long asymmetry, increased mechanical energy exchange, and decreased ox oxygen consumption during walking in people with type OA. Additionally, the decrease in step long asymmetry was associated with a decrease in oxygen consumption. Improved gait efficiency through spapial treadmill training could potentially promote better overall function and improve physical activity in people with HIPOA. However, for future research still need to examine whether effects following spapial treadmill training adaptation transfer to overground walking in HIPOA population. Um, thank you for your listening and I'm happy to take a question. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. And we'll now go to the Q&A portion of our session. So quick question uh, for Justin from uh, Sung Yun, which is also a question I had. Um, how would you expect the shear and normal forces to change for wheelchairs that are in motion, which I'm, I'm sure is a question that Sung Yun uh, might have for his own bulb <laughs> Uh, yeah, so previous research has shown that dynamic loads are, are higher for wheelchair users than static loads. Uh, one of the interesting things about the, the chair that we built is that that isolated seat pan tilt is not commercially available, so it's never been studied before uh, in, the, in a dynamic sense. So uh, there's actually a decreased contact and decreased area of contact in the buttocks and lower back with that seat pan tilt, which helps contribute to the lower, the lower loads in those areas. So if they are not in contact with the chair, if there's reduced contact, then they might have less of an increase uh, of the load magnitude due to the vibrations of dynamic loading, because it's just less, less area in contact. Uh, but we have not studied that. So that is purely a hypothesis uh, that we could study in the future. Great, thank you. All right, question for Sung Yun. Um, so from Feng Ying, uh, there's a question about the small, the apparent small base of support from the video clip that you showed. Do you anticipate that this would pose any fall risk for users in the case of a hard stop? Uh, yeah, so we do have a mechanical emergency mechanism where in case uh, there is a collision, it would deploy so that uh, the, ball, the wheelchair is uh, dynamically stable and statically stable as well. Um, the, that mechanism was not shown on the video clip, but we do, uh, we definitely have a uh, have plans for that. Um, Okay, and a question for uh, Chun Hao from Krista. Um, normally patients with hip OA walk with the asymmetry due to an antalgic gait pattern and or weakness. How do you think changing this asymmetry with split belt training uh, impacts their syndromes or sy symptoms, sorry? So that's a great question. Um, yeah, so actually, yeah, um, so after, so walking with a so a lot of a patient actually walk with a an large gate, but the participants we recruited is a little bit more functional uh, side of the par participants. So that definitely we need to explore the you know our experiment into the you know more severe po population um, to see how does that impact their symptoms. Uh, but as far as the, our participants join the the program, the protocol after they uh, finish the. Um, I mean, they, they tell us that oh, they, although they have a pain when a little bit of pain when they come inside to the um, uh, training, but after the training, they feel that they are more uh, comfortable and they reduce their pain. And so I think that this will help 
um, the participants to reduce their pain actually, because you know, a lot of the participants, a lot of the Ebola patients, they are less active, active and that's part of that uh, will increase their pain. But after they have some physical activity, uh, it could be reduce their pain. So yeah, that's my speculation of the, our uh, spiritual treadmill training to impact on their symptoms. Okay, and uh, one last question for Josh um, from from me. Uh, could you just take your best stab at where this uh, where the cycle for pain and weakness begins, and how how might you go about testing this? Yeah, I mean, I could take a stab at it for sure, but I don't know, uh, you know, how accurate it's going to be. And whatever I say here, I think you could convince me otherwise. So, um, I think in this group specifically, um, the low back pain. Um, was probably the driving factor for these um, compensation strategies that we see. We didn't report the data, but we have some pain data during the run. Um, but again, I think, um, you know, the counter argument that, you know, these individuals may have had these mechanical strategies in place before the low back pain is something that, you know, you, you could argue. So, um, Potentially one way to look at this and start teasing things out would be a more um, longitudinal approach where you can look at changes in the progression of pain and how that rate relates to changes in uh, mechanics. Um, if they don't uh, progress similarly, you know, throughout time, then maybe that can lead to um, further understanding. Um, but I think regardless of which one comes first, you know, the, the chicken or the egg question, I think it's just really important that early on to understand that these changes are occurring. And if we want to get into potential preventative strategies for things like NEOA, that intervening on individuals like this prior to them actually having the disease um, is critical. So whether or not they come first or last um, doesn't bother me as much as I'm more concerned with understanding the interaction between them. Great, thank you. So we'll move on to our third and final block of talks. Uh, so just brief introduction for myself. I'm Luke Nigro. I'm a um, PhD candidate in mechanical engineering at University of Delaware. Um, and our first speaker for this final block is Michael Teeter from the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Mechanics at Virginia Tech. Take it away, Michael. Oops, one second. Okay, I think that should be good. See everything, yep, take it away. Yeah, okay. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Teeter, and I'm a second year lab at Virginia Tech. Today, on behalf of my co-authors listed here, I will be presenting to you our study, Symmetry Differences in Stop-Jump Landing Mechanics After Anterior Cruciate Ligament Reconstruction. ACL reconstructions are performed in estimated 175,000 times annually. Studies have shown that up to 30% of ACLR athletes suffer a second ACL injury within 24 months of returning to sport. Currently, there's no consensus on the objective measures to use to determine readiness to return to sport participation following an ACLR. Previous research has used both ground reaction force and kinematic analysis of the ankle, knee, and hip to assess limb symmetry of ACLR athletes during landing. One particular metric that has not been considered as a potential risk factor for second ACL injury is limb stiffness and limb stiffness injury. Although limb stiffness has been studied extensively as it uh, pertains to running and hopping performance, limb stiffness asymmetry uh, has not been investigated during landing. So the purpose of the study was to compare the stop jump landing mechanics of an ACLR group and an asymptomatic control group using limb stiffness, joint work, and joint power, and the respective limb symmetry values. Performed between seven and 10 stop jumps, applied Helen Hayes marker set. For the limb dominance was defined as the foot to run forward about four to five steps, jump off one 
Michael, can we stop you for a second? Three dimensional motion. What's that? Can we, you're coming through really choppy. Is it possible for you to stop sharing your video? It might help with the internet speed or whatever's. Or if you stop sharing, just share the slides instead of the virtual background. I think you're freezing up on us here. Uh, yeah. In... Let's go ahead and keep moving. When he pops yeah. back in, we'll throw him in. Yeah, we'll, we'll move on to, um, hopefully we can bring him back at the end. So we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, Yanni Hathiodakis uh, from the Department of Biomedical Engineering at University of Connecticut. All right. You can see you just fine. Awesome. Right. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and the opportunity to present my work for you. So my talk today is titled An Implementation of Asymmetric Walking to Correct Between Limb Gait Asymmetries in Post-ACLR Individuals. So the broader issues we try to address with this study are ACL re-injury and the development of knee osteoarthritis for long-term post-ACLR patients. So here I'm going to first lay out quickly the life cycle of an ACL injury starting with the initial injury, followed by reconstruction surgery, then followed by extensive rehabilitation that's geared toward establishing a healthy enough gait to return to sport. However, despite ACL reconstruction and extensive rehabilitation, between limb gait differences can still persist in post-ACLR individuals. One of these gait differences is altered limb loading rate, which causes detrimental knee loading. This loading has been linked to higher rates of ACL re-injury, with ACLR athletes having a 29% chance of suffering a secondary ACL tear, which is five to 10 times the normal risk of someone tearing their ACL. Studies show that these athletes have developed multiple asymmetric loading adaptation strategies that include overloading their ACL reconstructed limb compared to their contralateral limb and underloading their ACL reconstructed limb compared to their contralateral limb. So a paper by Petra Simone in 2019 indicates that both of these asymmetric conditions may lead to poor post ACLR knee joint health. These varied compensation strategies also help explain why ACLR patients have a higher rate of re-injuring their affected limb and a higher than normal rate of injuring their unaffected limb. The altered loading patterns have also been linked to the development of post-traumatic knee osteoarthritis in these patients, with 45% of ACLR patients going on to develop knee osteoarthritis within 10 years of their surgery. So the primary variable that we're gonna focus on for this study is loading rate. Uh, this video shows a participant walking through their loading phase for a symmetric walking trial. So it is on a loop, it's not, it looks like that for a reason. Uh, for this study, we use average loading rate which is the slope of the line going from initial contact to the impact force peak for the vertical ground reaction force as shown here on the red. All of our, particip all of our participants for the study display loading rate asymmetry during their symmetric walking trials. So we defined each of their limbs as overloaded or underloaded based on their results. The overloaded limb is the limb that experienced a higher average loading rate over the course of the symmetric trials and the underloaded limb is the limb that experienced the lower loading rate. We introduced this nomenclature to highlight the adaptation patterns that were adopted by our participants. Each participant did have loading rate asymmetry, but it did not always favor their ACLR limb or their healthy limb. To reiterate from the previous slide, asymmetric loading is common after ACL reconstruction and is detrimental to knee health, leading to increased risk of secondary ACL injury and the development of knee OA, which is why we considered it our variable of interest for this study. So like I said, our goal of the study was to address the limb loading asymmetry for post-ACLR participants using an asymmetric walking protocol to help restore symmetric loading rates. This protocol was chosen because it's previously been used to accomplish the same goal for post-stroke rehabilitation patients. Um, I'm just going to gloss over the participant demographics for this study. They're shown here on the slide and move right on to the actual asymmetric walking protocol that we performed. So it begins with an acclimation period with the individual speeds that are used for the asymmetric trials, in this case, one and 1.5 meters per second. After acclimation, we do a baseline test that's run at the slower speed. This provides a baseline for comparison with the washout trials that we're gonna use during, uh, to de-adapt de the participants after their asymmetric trials. So after the baseline, we have the first adaptation, which uses one combination of the two walking speeds, then a symmetric de-adaptation to wash out any lingering effects. Then we switch the belt speeds for the second adaptation, and there's a final de-adaptation to reestablish the participant's normal gait. We use the acclimation and baseline trials, as I said, 
to establish which limb we consider uh, overloaded and which is considered underloaded by comparing the average loading rate between the limbs. We then use those classifications to group the limb data for each participant. The trials that we're gonna focus on for the results are shown here. It's the two adaptation trials at the asymmetric walking speeds to see how they can affect limb uh, symmetry. So for the results, we looked at the average loading rate for each minute of the trial and plotted it over time to show any possible adaptations over time. So these upcoming plots represent the average data for all eight participants at each minute of the trial. So first, for the asymmetric trial with the overloaded limb moving faster, the initial data shows a larger loading rate in the underloaded limb compared to the overloaded limb. But over time, they returned the same initial limb loading pattern with a higher loading rate in the overloading limb, overloaded limb compared to the underloaded limb as the participants get used to the experimental condition. More interestingly, for the asymmetric trial with the overloaded limb moving slower, the, the initial pattern matches the loading conditions from symmetric trials with a larger loading late rate for the overloaded limb compared to the underloaded limb. However, this result shows that the overall adaptation actually ends up being a convergence of the loading rates to reach a point of symmetry over time, as we see the loading rate of the overloaded limb decreases to match that of the underloaded limb in this case. So finishing off with some conclusions from these results, we believe that an asymmetric walking gait retraining protocol has the potential to help restore loading symmetry to post-ACLR patients, hopefully lessening the chance of re-injury and knee osteoarthritis development. We see from this specific study that we can establish the symmetry when the overloaded limb is moving slower than the underloaded limb. So that's a result we'd like to carry forward to subsequent studies. And then our future work would focus on determining if this could actually be a valid gait retraining protocol, which would involve experimenting with the relationship between the length of the trial and the magnitude of the asymmetry while observing if the loading asymmetry will continue to persist after the trial or not. Uh, lastly, I'd like to invite any questions and I'd also like to thank my co-collaborators, uh, my fellow grad student, Hilia mazun al and my advisor, Dr. Kristen Morgan. Thank you all. I did great, thank you, Yanni. Um, so Michael, uh, can we bring you back right now? So we'll do, once again, Michael Teeter from uh, Virginia Tech. Sorry about the little hiccup there. All right, let's see if I can get this going this time. So how about we just pick up where you left off? Yeah. Uh, was to compare this option plan and mechanics of an ACLR group and an asymptomatic control group using limb stiffness, joint work, and joint power, and their respective limb symmetry values. So 40 ACLR and 60 control recreational athletes were recruited for this study. After signing an institutional review board approved consent form, each athlete performed between seven and 10 stop jumps while wearing a modified Helen Hayes marker set. For the control group, Limb dominance was defined as the foot used to kick a ball. To complete the task, athletes were instructed to run forward about four to five steps, jump off one leg, and land with each foot on a separate force plate before jumping vertically as high as they could. Force plates and three-dimensional motion capture were used to collect kin kinetic and kinematic data during the first landing of the stop jump. Limb stiffness, negative joint power, and negative joint work were calculated from initial contact to the lowest position of the sacral marker during the first landing of the stop jump. Limb stiffness is the ratio of the maximum vertical ground reaction force over the change in the center of mass. Negative joint power is the product of joint moment and joint angular velocity. Negative joint work is the cumulative integral of joint power over time. The normalized symmetry index was used to compute limb symmetry for each of these measurements, where zero equals complete symmetry between limbs, positive values indicate higher non-surgical or dominant limb values, and negative indicate greater surgical or non-dominant limb values. Independent sample t-tests were then used to determine significant differences between groups for symmetry values of limb stiffness and ankle, knee, and hip joint power and joint work. I wanted to note that the results shown slightly differ from the abstract. The data analysis and statistical analysis did not change. However, corrections were made in the visual 3D data processing, which altered the extracted data. The bar charts shown here display mean and standard deviation um, values for limb stiffness, negative joint work, and negative joint power for the surgical and non-surgical limbs of the ACLR group and the non-dominant and non-dominant limbs of the control group, respectively. 
the magnitude of each non surgical limb outcome measurement value was greater than that of the surgical limb for the ACLR group, although the degree of difference is varied, whereas the values across control group limbs are consistently similar. This next chart shows the mean and standard deviation symmetry calculations for each outcome measure for the ACLR and control groups. The result of each NSIT test is also included above each comparison. And as a reminder, positive NSI values signify increased asymmetry. Significant differences were found between the ACLR and control groups for limb stiffness, negative knee and hip work, and negative knee and hip power. For each of these outcome measures, the ACLR group displayed greater asymmetry. NSI values for negative ankle work and power were not statistically different between groups. Decreased limb symmetry in ACLR athletes show how this population uses altered landing techniques when compared to their uninjured counterparts. Given the link between vertical ground reaction force and the outcomes of interest in the study, it's possible that the difference in limb loading is associated with decreased symmetry in limb stiffness, joint work, and joint power in the ACLR group. Further research is warranted to determine how additional factors such as center of mass, joint coordination, and individual joint stiffness may affect limb symmetry during this stop. Findings from the study indicate that ACLR athletes land unevenly during a stop jump. Developing a, the habit of consistently offloading the surgical limb and favoring the non-surgical side may lead to future injury. This lack of lower extremity control by ACLR athletes could ultimately, ultimately increase the risk of suffering a second ACL injury. There's a clear need to develop prevention strategies that improve symmetry during dynamic movements, such as the stop jump, to mitigate second ACL injury risk. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this presentation today and dealing with that technical difficulty. Uh, if you'd like to connect with our lab, here's our website and Twitter handle. And additionally, here's my personal email for direct contact. Thanks. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, moving on to our third speaker, um, Jennifer Perry from the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Ohio State. Oh, Michael, could you, oh, there we go. There we go. I got it, <laughs> my bad. Great, thank you. Um, as Michael and Yanni did a great job explaining here, uh, in spite of the best efforts of physicians and physical therapists, young active individuals who undergo ACL reconstruction often experience multiple suboptimal outcomes, such as continued limited function, inability to return to their previous level activity, and up to 30% having a secondary ACL injury within two years of returning to sport. Atypical knee kinematics and kinetics observed in individuals who are medically cleared to return to sport after ACL reconstruction have been related to these suboptimal outcomes, notably the frontal plane knee kinematics and kinetics, but the knee does not work in isolation. Due to the link system nature of the lower extremity, coordination of one joint is affected by the others. Dynamic movement theory is one way that we can look at the coordination between joints. And it proposes that there is a preferred range of movement variability for stable and consistent movement strategies. Both too little variability or too much variability could be associated with suboptimal outcomes in young active individuals after ACL reconstruction. And that's what we're gonna look at here today. To investigate coordination variability, we start with the kinematic curves of two joints. The sagittal plane hip angle and frontal plane knee angles during a landing task are shown here as an example to help guide us. We then create an angle angle plot to show to see how motion and positioning of one joint relates to that of the other. From this plot, we calculate the coupling angle between the joints by taking the angular slope of the angle angle curve, representing the coordination between these joints. The variability of coordination was then calculated using the circular standard deviation of the root mean square between three motion trials. For this study, there are 116 ACL reconstruction participants who were followed longitudinally in the study for at least two years and 55 age and activity level matched healthy controls. For this analysis, the ACL reconstruction group was subdivided based on occurrence of a second ACL injury within two years of return to sport. 
Comparisons of variability at time of return to sport were made between healthy controls, ACLR with second injury, and ACLR without a second injury. We investigated all coupling angle combinations of the hip, knee, and ankle joints during a single leg landing task in these young athletes. The only coupling angle variability to have any significance between groups was found in hip flexion knee abduction coupling angles. Hip flexion knee abduction coordination variability can be interpreted as the frontal plane knee control as the hip flexes during landing. From previous work, we know that increased motion of the knee in the frontal plane is a predictor of second ACL injuries. When looking at limb symmetry of hip flexion knee abduction variability, we see that participants who do not go on to have a second ACL injury have a smaller difference in variability between their limbs. When looking at the limbs individually, we see a significantly lower variability on the uninvolved limb for those with a second injury compared to the uninvolved limbs of those without a second injury in healthy controls. There are no significant differences found on the involved limb between groups, although that could be due to group size, which we are currently working to expand for further analysis. Putting all of these results together and in context, the relative increase in the involved limb variability in participants who suffer a second injury compared to their uninvolved limb may be an important factor to consider um, when looking at clearing for return to sport and assessing the risk of a second ACL injury. While we don't yet know the ideal numerical range of variability for a landing task in this population, we did see that participants who went on to suffer a second ACL injury had a greater variability asymmetry at time of return to sport. Therefore, when determining readiness to return to sport in young athletes after ACL reconstruction, Rather than focusing solely on singular repetitions or single joint mechanics, clinicians should also consider the variability of dynamic task coordination. Thank you, and here you can see our funding sources. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so just a quick reminder, we will have spatial chat uh, in the Aristotle room after the session. Um, we might not have time for questions during the session for this block, um, but we'll save the chat and we can send, you know, so we can reference questions uh, in the spatial chat. All right. So our last speaker uh, for the day is Alexa Johnson from the School of Kinesiology at the University of Michigan. Hi, and uh, thanks for being here today. I'm going to talk to you about some quadriceps torque complexity before and after ACL reconstruction. So after ACL injury, we see a decline in quadriceps strength. And as a lot of the, my previous speakers have mentioned, um, and after subsequent ACL reconstruction, we continue to see a, this decline in strength. And while rehabilitation is focused on regaining this muscle strength, there always tends to be a lingering level of quadriceps weakness. And most research has looked at this in the form of the discrete points of the quadriceps torque curve. Some of our previous research has also identified that there's impaired rate of torque development in this population uh, when compared to their uninvolved limb, but also to a healthy control group. Um, but this still kind of limits the portion of the torque curve that we are analyzing. So here you can see um, two very different types of torque curves in the form of these groups. So the much taller um, I would say stronger torque curves are a lot smoother um, in relation to the three that are on the lower half where they look a little bit more chaotic, um, so to speak. Uh, we believe that this is related to the torque quality and that this torque quality may hinder an, ability, an individual's ability to regain their necessary strength after surgery, um, which has been linked to outcomes after ACL reconstruction long-term in terms of secondary injuries and post-traumatic knee osteoarthritis. Therefore, the purpose of our project was to longitudinally assess torque complexity before and after ACL reconstruction. And we believe that those um, with ACL reconstruction will demonstrate increased torque complexity in the involved limb compared to the uninvolved limb, and that this torque complexity will not return to pre-surgical levels by their time of return to activity. 
We had 34 individuals who completed three maximal voluntary isometric contractions after their ACL injury before surgery, and then approximately five months after surgery. And then again, within two weeks after they were cleared to return to activity, which for our cohort landed about nine months after surgery. From this isometric contraction torque curve, we calculated entropy along the plateau of the quadriceps torque curve. Entropy is a measure of signal regularity and predictability. And while I'm not gonna super explain uh, the equation in this short time, I'm happy to talk about it later. Um, but briefly, it's measuring a signal's points in relation to one another in terms of distance and their ability to fit into a similarity criterion. So a time series with similar distances between data points indicates predictability and results in lower sample entropy values uh, represented by the graph on the left. A large difference between data points indicates complexity resulting in greater entropy values, which is represented as the graph on the right. So we completed a three by two time by limb repeated measures ANOVA with Bonferroni post hocs to find that quadriceps torque uh, was lower in the involved limb when compared to the uninvolved limb at every time point. And that quadriceps torque in the involved limb was also lower at mid when compared to pre and return to activity. There were no differences between pre and return to activity in that quadriceps torque and no differences in change in torque in the uninvolved limb. In regards to torque complexity, uh, entropy values were higher in the involved limb compared to the uninvolved limb at mid and at return to activity, indicating greater complexity. And the involved limb demonstrated an increase in torque complexity following surgery from pre to mid, but not pre to return to activity or not mid for to return to activity. And surprisingly, the uninvolved limb had a significantly less complexity from pre to return to activity, but no differences between pre and mid or pre and return to activity, which I think we expected. Um, so what this kind of looks like for us is that quadriceps torque complexity is affected by surgery and doesn't necessarily return to uh, the levels that we want it to after surgery. Um, so in individual kind of uh, plots, you can see that before surgery, with the exception of a few people, quadriceps entropy is fairly even, but after surgery, you see a big increase in entropy on the ACL reconstructed limb um, in relation to the non-ACL reconstructed limb. So what does this mean for us? Um, that quadriceps torque complexity is increased following surgery and doesn't necessarily recover to the level which the uninvolved limb is operating at. We believe that these increases in quadriceps torque complexity may result from altered neuromuscular function that is impairing an individual's ability to sustain a consistent and coordinated muscle contraction. This is possibly because of altered motor unit firing in the muscles, as well as possibly corticospinal, corticospinal deficits that are contributing to the inability to sustain a consistent contraction. Um, new therapies are likely necessary to improve quadriceps muscle function after ACL reconstruction, um, which is kind of our next steps. So I just wanna acknowledge my co-authors, my lab, um, and happy to answer questions in spatial chat for the sake of time. Thank you, Alexa. Um, yeah, so we are at time now for this session. So I encourage everyone to go over to the Aristotle room for spatial chat. Um, if you have any questions, um, we'll be there. Uh, so yeah, I guess, I guess that's everything. Just one note to presenters, I'll be emailing you the questions that were submitted in the chat. So if the email on your abstract is not yours, please put your email into the chat now before you leave the room. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for a great session and happy last day of ASB. Thanks, everyone. Sophia, is there anything else that we need to check on before closing out? Nope, that's it. And I can end the meeting.
Okay, so we'll hop over to Spanish. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yay, we right, did. Thanks, Italian, Luke. <laughs> Bye. Bye.